Hi, right, Brian. How are you doing? I'm well, my friend. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Listen, uh, first thing I'm going to say to you, uh, I remember Christopher Columbus set off uh, from Palace in Spain on the 3rd of August, 1492. But if I remember rightly, it was your birthday, not on the 2nd of August, is it not? It was. Well, he was celebrating my birthday before he could get on the boat. <laughs> is the so, problem. Yeah, Peter O'Toole's, he celebrates the same birthday as you, by the way. I thought you'd know that. but Oh, really? You, yeah. And have you been keeping all right? You've been keeping very well, Richard. How about you? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. You look good. How are things? Uh, how how is how is how's Glasgow been? Well, it's been okay. We've had a lockdown, as you can imagine, but we started to open up at a week ago. A lot of the restaurants and bars are slowly opening up, but it's not a big rush. It's uh, taking it very cautiously. The weekends are slightly getting busier, but you know, all our distilleries are slowly getting back. Bottling halls are getting back. It's a slow progress, but uh, at least, uh, you know, we're trying to do the best we can. Not an easy circumstance. Sure. So did that, were you, did, did they have to shut down or did you guys have to shut down distilleries as well as bottling yeah. or was yeah. it more of a bottling issue? No, we, we had to close down the distilleries, but what we did do more than anything is Invergordon, a grain distillery remained open because we've now up to about 12 million liters of alcohol has gone towards making wow. sanitizers and sanitizers. So we're, we're making our part, our distribution. We're very proud of the people at the Invergordon Distillery for doing that, uh, but it's helping a lot of the communities, not just in Scotland, England, but in different parts of the world that we've managed to get sanitizers out. So we've helped in, 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 that, in that particular way but as you can imagine, we want to get production, you know, bottling, everything up to speed because, uh, you know, it's very important to try and keep the morale. And that's one of our oh, sure. safety of our staff is paramount importance, but we're trying to keep the morale and trying to keep the economy going in some way. Yeah. Well, and everyone, we don't as you figured out by now here, it's Whiskey Wednesday with Vinny's. Oh not just Brett and Richard catch up on things, but Richard Patterson from Dalmore <laughs> is here with us. If you have any questions today, whether it's about the weather in Glasgow or what whiskey Richard's drinking, please use the Q&A function down at the bottom of the Zoom panel. If you're on Facebook, just type your question on Facebook and we'll get that answered too. Uh, sorry to interrupt, gentlemen, but carry <laughs> sorry, on. Sorry, we're just, we haven't <laughs> seen each other in a while, so. <laughs> So we are here with Richard though, and we want to talk about whiskey and not just the weather. Uh, I'm really glad you're making hand sanitizer. It's great to see that everybody in the industry is doing their part with all this. Um, you have been in the industry uh, through several thick and thin periods, I suppose. What is it, 55 years now, Richard? Uh, coming up, nearly that, 55 years, yeah. Yeah, but it's, um, you know, I, I always say it might be 54, 55 years, but my passion for it has really never diminished. It's if anything, it's been enhanced. And when I look at the likes of Pat and Brett, I see these lovely young faces and, you know, <laughs> they're taking care. And of course, you know, it, it's, it's the appreciation. And it's so nice that so many of you are tuning in today and, you know, maybe perhaps enjoying uh, some scotch uh, over Zoom, you know, today and over the computer, which is, that's what it's all about. So 54 years ago, when you, what did you do when you started? What was your first job in the whiskey business? The first job in the whiskey business was uh, the 5th of September, 1966, when I joined A. Gillison Company, which means nothing to you guys. But the only thing it might mean is that it owned uh, Glen Scotia Distillery and down in Campbellton. And my first job with the company was to look after the stocks. I used to not have the computer and put all the details that was being distilled down at Glen Scotia and the bending. I had to hand write these big, huge ledgers that went into these huge safes that had to be maintained in any whiskey company as well as his distillery because as in Kentucky, the fire was our biggest problem. Therefore, every whiskey company had these huge safes 
and held these huge ledgers. So that was the initial job. But during that time, it was a small company. I got into the blending like my father, my grandfather, and I stemmed from there. And then in 1970, joined White and Mackay. So 50 years with White and Mackay. So how many great celebrations have been intercepted this year for you? Well, there's been... <laughs> <laughs> well, 50 years will happen on that next month, on the 14th of September. And, wow. you know, we've had a few celebrations when it was 50 years in the industry, and now we'll be 50 years with White and Mackay. But, you know, the Dalmore at White and Mackay, along with Jura, Berakir, and Tam of Ulan, and, uh, of course, uh, Invergarden itself, uh, you know, has uh, gone dramatically successful, uh, you know, over the years. And they have become, you know, major uh, brands that have brought better awareness. But, you know, Brett, when I see your lovely face, uh, you will remember that in 1998, the first whiskey festival was in New York. And uh, first one was Absolutely. in uh, Frankfurt before it went to New York. But that whiskey festival and the ones in Chicago have helped to bring greater awareness of scotch and not just scotch but bourbons and small batch bourbons and canadian whiskies and japanese whiskies you name it so you know the whiskey festivals have been really important people have you know got a better you know knowledge and that's why when we meet people today as i'm sure in binnies the consumer the customer is far more knowledgeable than they ever were and, and that's, you're right. And now it's everybody. I mean, if you remember those first few, you know, when you're on the circuit for those first few whiskey festivals in the late 90s, early 2000s, you kind of noticed you would see the same 50, then 100, then 200 people. And it would be the same group of people in America from New York to Chicago to San Francisco. And I'm sure the same group of people from Limburg and Edinburgh and, and, and everywhere, you know, all over the place in Europe. And you're right now, people who weren't even old enough to shop then are coming yeah. in and actually buying whiskey. Yeah. I mean, even if you go to Shanghai, like uh, Shanghai, just uh, quite a number of months ago, you know, we got somewhere in the region of 30,000 people, you know, uh, coming to wow. that festival in Shanghai but the money was being spent but it gives you an idea the, the people were not coming in zoomers zimmers or what have you or walking sticks these were young people and that is what's changed young people are coming and far more knowledgeable it's not an old man's drink this is a young trendy drink and it, the people are looking to see are we drinking it in the right way not knocking it back like cowboys maybe in the early years uh, as you saw in the American uh, uh, cowboy films, they're, they're being far more respectful. You see that at Brett's condo as well. There's no respect <laughs> for the whiskey. Just knocks it down. Just shooting them. <laughs> well, so so that must be amazing. So how do you when you're so you've done you've worn a lot of different hats. The primary one being a blender. How how far ahead have you tried to stay as all these trends are happening? How has the way you have had to think changed in the last 50 years, even more important, just in the last 20 to 25 years? How rapidly have you had to change the way you think about things to continue to adjust to all these new people entering the market? Well, you know, uh, all I would say to you that is number of areas. First of all, 90% of the whiskey market 90, 91% is still for blended whiskey. 9% to even 10% is single malts. My hat is for blending, whether it be blending of uh, blended whiskeys or preparation of single malts have in fact, you know, really burst open because yeah, we're looking at American white oak bourbon casks. And then of course we've been using sherry casks for, you know, well over a hundred years, bringing in for the Dalmore from Gonzalez Bias. But we've been far more adventurous because, as you know, Brett, if I turned up at a whiskey festival today with a 10-year-old Jura and a 12-year-old Dalmore, they'd kill me because people are looking for innovation. And that's why we're going to various parts of the world, but to try and get exclusivity 
like the Dalmore King Alexander you're going to taste tonight, six different finishes, Port, Madeira, Marsala, Cabernet Sauvignon, small batch bourbon, and Methuselah Sherry. That's a whole chocolate box that started with maybe one seasoning has gone into six. But now we're looking at individual, really craft, special vineyards that are going to give us the style that we're looking for that will match and be compatible with our particular single malt. So the biggest change has been innovation to stimulate the demanding consumer, which is now out there and looking for something different, but something to enjoy. Never forget, we must always have the quality. The quality of our single malts remains sacrosanct. But what also you're seeing is like the Dalmore, we're going to an age of 50 years old, 51, 62, 64. A lot of people don't have these single malts of that age. And that tells us if you want to be in this business, you have to think not the short term, but the long term. And as you've seen in America, all these new boutique distilleries are now emerging in thousands, not hundreds, yeah. thousands, thousands. In, in the UK. So we're going to see a new innovation with the boutique styles coming in. That's going to be another different approach to drinking uh, different spirits. Speaking of small distilleries, Richard, uh, our first question of the night is from Jay and Karen Lee, and they'd like to hear more about that wee pot still behind you. And the exact quote is, it's adorbs. Uh, that pot still is uh, just one of many, um, just one of many that I carry around with me uh, when I'm doing presentations. Uh, that is actually to show you the bulbous nature, the big style of, you know, the Dalmore whiskey, because we don't have these thin, very small stills. They're big, fat, bulbous stills that gives us that complexity, that what we call reflux. But it's a way of trying to convey to many of the consumers, this is a pot still. This is the spirit that has been produced. White dog, as you say, in America. New spirit when it comes to Scotland until it's matured in the cast for three years. So the shape of the still, more than anything, is so, so important. And that's part of the reason Dalmore holds up so well to these various wine finishes and heavy sherries, right? I mean, because you have that bulbous shape of the still, it produces a muscular spirit, would you say? I mean, it, it's, it's yeah. refined and it's clean because of all that reflux, but it has the structure to hold up to that sherry aging. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great uh, question, Pat, because, you know, when we're talking about sherry, we're talking about the Methuselah sherry. Methuselah is 30 years old. That's a very rich style of sherry. And you're absolutely right. With a, having the body of Dalmore, it can then be compatible with the body of the, the sherry and work. If it was a light style, like our maybe our Tam Navulam, if you put too much weight of the sherry or even the wine, it will start to dominate it. So that's why you've got to have that, you know, love and affection, but you've got to have that unison about being compatible with each other. And the whole heaviness of that Dalmore mi mi mixes perfectly with the, with the weight of the sherry. How hard is it to get those Methuselah sherry barrels now? I mean, you, we talk to more and more producers and everything is sherry season now where they take some American oak cask and throw sherry in it and keep it in the backyard for three months and then make vinegar and sell the cask to Scotland. Yeah, great question again, because what you need to do is to have a good stock of it. Now, we've been dealing with uh, the likes of Gonzalez Bias for over 100 years ago, with documentation going back over 100 years ago. But what a lot of people don't realize, we are now the biggest owners of sherry. We've got a share in Gonzalez Bias. We own Garvey's, we own Harvey's, and of course, Fundador uh, Sherry, uh, the company there, is what we own as well. So we've got great access. But remember, these sherry cars were working on a sort of 10 year cycle to make sure that we have the stocks of paramount importance that are there consistently giving us the name Methuselah. Methuselah means very old and uh, it is 30 years old. You know, if I, you know, just look at this, uh, here it is here. This is the, this is the Methuselah sherry. And uh, you'll see immediately, it says 30 years old. Sometimes you see in rum, but it also means very old. But this is 75% Palomino Fino, 
25% Pedro Jimenez. And that Pedro Jimenez, that great being put on the Esparto mats to give us that sweetness, the richness, gives us 127 grams of sugar. So when we put it into the cask, it remains in the pores of the wood for up to, you know, 10%. And then we allow the whiskey to go into the cask and bring it out at the pores of the wood. We're not allowed to add the sherry, of course, to the whiskey. That's totally illegal, but it draws it naturally. But again, it's keeping the balance, the balance of the style of Dalmore with the balance of the sherry. So, so important. So that's good. So the critical, how much as you're exploring some of these alternate wood sources, are you, how does that work? Is that, are you actively involved in seeking out the new sources for Madeira, for port, for the red wines, for anything else? Or are there people that are sort of scouting and bringing best examples to you? Because this is very difficult to just say yes, 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 because until you put something in it, you don't know what you're going to get. Exactly. What you must do is think of uh, the style of your Dalmore, Jura, Fedeke, and Tamavulan. You must know that as a person. That individual becoming young, old, middle-aged, or what have you, is going to change. But you must have in your head how it's going to change, what kind of flavors are going to emanate. As soon as you see these flavors, as soon as you see the change, and then you go to a bodega or you go to a winery, and here's the Cabernet Sauvignon. Look how big it is. Look at the, the, the cassis. And then you think of the whiskey and you say, wait a minute, that body of that whiskey of my single malt will actually be compatible with this style of wine or this style of sherry. And then you watch it. How long will it take? Will it take two years, three years, four years? That's mother nature. That's what you've got to wait for. And you must be, must be patient. You've just said something right on the nail or we put the sherry in the cask, put a whiskey in for five minutes or three days or four days, maybe six months, and that's it. Doesn't work like that. No. This is something that's got to take years and years before you find the compatibility. But what you mustn't do is let that sherry or that wine start to dominate the DNA of, that, of your single malt. It's mm -hmm. got to be compatible at the end of the day. Okay, so I would imagine that I would imagine that the quality of the wood that the, the winery or the bodega or the port producer, or whatever. So I imagine you have to do some scouting to make sure they're using quality wood before you even consider. Yeah. There's no such right. thing as a cheap experiment with a single no, malt in a new no, type of you, barrel you, like this. You, you remember what I do, as I've said on a few occasions, I might've said it to you, Brett already twice a year, I will go up to Edinburgh Garden and Dalmore and I will literally know thousands of casks. To me, it's the best time. It's the most time that I really enjoy because what I'm watching and Margaret, who's with me, as well as Greg, what we say is the terminology goes to something like that. Hello, are you asleep? Are you a baby? Are you an old man? Are you, do you need a new dress? Do you need a new suit? <laughs> wow, are you totally asleep there? Do you need to kick up your backside? And it's <laughs> one cross, two cross or three crosses. But that's how they work. But when you hit the jackpot, when you look at a whiskey that's maybe 30, 35, it's been in the cast for two, three years, you go, hello, that's what I'm waiting for. But it's not the full answer. We take these samples from the distillery, from our warehouses, bring them back to Glasgow and put them into uh, the sample room and let them air for at least two days and let them shine in their own temperature so that you can really look at what the quality is all about. It's not a quick fix. It's testing, testing, testing the whole time. Sure. So that's, I think it's part because when we started this thing, you and I were kind of talking, it's like, oh, what's happening with COVID? Or you have to shut down. And I think sometimes people forget in the whiskey world, especially in the Scotch whiskey world, that we, what is happening right now isn't necessarily going to affect you directly as much it's going to affect either your job 12 years from now, 15 years from now, 18 years from now, that's when you're going to see some of these effects because yeah. there's going to be that tiniest little hole in stocks because of the amount of time where you couldn't keep that, that, you know, where you couldn't keep that planning ahead rolling. Yeah. 
These, these months will be taken into consideration already and they'll be put aside. But when it comes into within a two year, you know, coming into that area, we will already make provisions to maybe take a little bit older or younger, whatever, to compensate for that. Remember, what we've gone through just now is many scenarios because sometimes you get barley that's not right, sometimes distillation's up, sometimes we get years, the production was down. So these are, these are kind of events that are not, not normal, but they're not unnormal. They are things right. that we have to contend with. But at the end of the day, never forget, we must have the style, but we must maintain the consistency. That's what it's all about. So on the consistency thing, I noticed, uh, if you want to maybe talk about the Dalmore Portwood here, I noticed the first thing I noticed as, as a longtime Dalmore fan, it was one of the earliest whiskeys, earliest Scotch whiskeys I tasted uh, when I started working at Binney's a while ago. Uh, this new Portwood was at a significantly higher proof than the other Dalmores. Um, yeah, you want to yeah. maybe talk about how you came to that decision in the blending? Right. What, what we've got here is the Dalmore Portwood, and this is a 46.5% alcohol. It's a bit like when we work with Port or we work with Cabernet or, you know, maybe we brought cars from the Napa or Sonoma uh, Valley. We want to make sure that we expose these kind of wine notes naturally. If you take it down to 40%, and let me just pour the first one into, now a lot of guys are, this is the, the normal uh, nosing glass. Some of you might not have this particular glass. Some of you might have, uh, you know, the famous uh, Glen Cane glass, or some of you might even have a, a whiskey tumbler. But really when it comes to the blending, when it comes to the examination, this really is the only glass that we'd be really using. So this is 46.5%. And then when you say hello, you do it very slowly, go back to it. But what you will see more than anything is take your time. You've got two nostrils, one will be better than the other. Please don't do any of this stuff. You know, when I see people like that, quite often they'll don't. But anyway, just make sure you go up and say hello and look at it, 46.5, you're gonna see the DNA, that the DNA of Dalmore is chocolate orange, chocolate orange, but when you look at towards the dry down or the end of the, the aroma, you're gonna see that lovely cassis and that plum note coming through because this has been matured in Graham's Port. This is Graham's Port, Tawny Port. Uh, you know, if anybody's unfamiliar with the Graham's label. There we have the Graham's label. Uh, this is a company that started uh, 200 years this year, the 200th anniversary in 1820. And we've been dealing exclusively with Graham's port in the port uh, for Tonys and Colhitas and vintages. But we find that the Tony port, 10 years old, 20, 30, 40, is just ideally suited. So when you look at it, you're gonna see that lovely plum note coming through, not dominating but just got that great charm. And because it's 46.5, you're gonna see that weight of it. Now, some people might say it's a little bit strong. If you feel it's a bit strong, just add a little water. But I don't, I don't like to add water to this. I like to take it straight. So for all these wonderful people around the Chicago area and even further, I hope you're having a great evening. Let's just share this one together. You say slangy va, here we go. Cheers. And let it go down. Wait for it. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now it begins to come up. First nose is. First taste is important, but it's always the second. So we go back again. And let it go down. Now having it the second time on your palate, you open it up and it reveals that chocolate orange, the cinnamon spice, just a hint of balsamic because a lot of old whiskeys are in this. And then you'll see that cassis 
the plum note, but it's charm, really great charm. And this is something to really sip and savor. But because it's 46.5, you really are retaining it. But I say, if you find it too strong, if you go like this, big problem. Then add a little water to it. Don't add ice, please. I know a lot of people like it, but it just freezes it. It just masks it. Try and use it straight, but use the palate. Interesting that the spice came through more on the second pass. And I, yeah. maybe, maybe you were talking it, me into it with the um, elaborate uh, tasting there, but it definitely immediately the baking spice note came out. Like initially it was just a lot of the expected fruit that you would get out of a port cast, but then second time around it showed a lot more sweet brown baking spice character. Yeah. It's really interesting. And, and you know, for this one, Pat, because it's a 46.5% alcohol, you really want to enjoy it have a coffee, then have the whiskey, then have the bitter chocolate, let that melt go down the mouth. And if you're really in the mood, take a really great, uh, you know, Particus number two, Hoya de Monterey epic number two, uh, you know, just a nice cigar, even Dominican Republic and what have you, and it'll go perfectly because the weight of the cigar, the weight of the whiskey and the strength is again, very compatible. It is a spirit that can actually hold up to a cigar. I will give it that. Yeah. Um, you know, I tend to poo-poo a lot of cigar and spirits pairings just because I think a lot of times, you you know, you have a big, strong cigar and all it does is kind of dull the spirit, I think. But when you have one of these big wine barrel finished single malts with the structure and the bones to it, it's one of the few things that I think actually can hold up to a good cigar. Yeah. yeah. But again, like all these things, you guys out there, please, you must take your time. Do not be in a hurry no matter which spirit you take, especially the Dalmore, really, really sip, savor, and hold it long on the palate to enjoy these flavors. It's taken years to put together, you know, putting the, you know, the, 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 the sherry butts takes it, you know, takes a long time, but the port wine pipes, the port wine pipes in comparison to the sherry takes even longer. We find that it has to be five, six years if we really want to draw out every bit of that cassis, that plum note from these port hmm. pipes. Very difficult to handle. They're big, they're strong, nearly 600 liters, difficult to maneuver. But when they come up to, you know, expectations, absolutely beautiful. I think the, uh, the weight was well worth it because it is, it is really lovely as far as the textures that you got, uh, yeah. that you with the liquid as well as the the just the layers of flavor because it it's a it's not a one trick thing you know it just keeps no. going and joe you know you, you said it so many times you've got to be patient a lot of people i watched the program before i came on tonight and i saw this guy just knocking it back and i said you know i was like what are you doing you paid all that money and you're just treating it you know disrespectfully really hold up in the palate top of the tongue underneath back in the middle it's the same with the food, great restaurant. You don't swallow the food, you chew it. The more you chew it, the more you extract the flavors. Don't be in a hurry. That's good food advice too. This is great life advice. Indeed it is. <laughs> well, one of the other big white Mackay single malt distilleries that's more prominently featured in the United States is, is a coastal malt, right? And that's our next whiskey here is from the Isle of Jura. Yeah, Jura, if you've never been, this is, uh, we've got the, the Seven Wood. Uh, this is uh, Jura. It's a small island. It's uh, only uh, 26 miles long by one to eight miles wide. Present uh, number of people living on the islands, about 230. It's even less just now because a lot of people use that as their holiday homes. Uh, it's, of course, dominated by what we call the Paps of Jura these three big mountains, but it's a fabulous, fabulous, wonderful place. The only distillery there is Jura. What a, what a, what a, what a marketing coup. What, what's the name of your distillery? <laughs> Where does it come from? Jura. And of course, Jura means red deer. And there's about 5,600 red deer, it goes up and down. Uh, but that's what Jura actually means. But, you know, with only, you know, 100, 230 people or so, you're more likely to see a deer as opposed to, you know, an individual person. But it is an island, it's got complexity. And, you know, we wanted to expose that naturalness. Unlike Dalmore, this loves American white oak, it loves oak. 
And this is uh, seven wood. This has got limousine oak, tronquet, allier, vosges, jupel, les batons, and of course, Frenchly emptied uh, American white oak. So all these lovely, rich, spicy notes that are emanating from that, you can see immediately, you know, when you look at it, you've got that lovely soft sort of, you know, honey, pear, apple, candied apple that is, you know, very much there, but it's very pleasant. It's not heavy. It's got that, those, the stills are very tall, by the way, uh, you know, 24 feet, four and three quarter inches tall, but they are very elegant, very beautiful, and they produce that lighter spirit, that charming, more akin to a Speyside single malt, but because it comes from the island of uh, Jura, it's got that individuality, just a little hint of what I call pine notes coming through towards the end, but very, very compatible. This is coming in at 42% alcohol. So again, you know, I will say to you, and I, I can't remember if Brett's been down there, you know, when do you drink? What's the best way to drink Jura? With the wind and rain in your face, you know, when you're down there, if you ever sit on the pier from a lot of people do that, you know, it's really fantastic. Or as somebody's just mentioned to me about the, uh, you know, Bill about the Cory Vrecken, uh, that's a whirlpool, a natural whirlpool up at the top. Mm -hmm. you go over across it, that's when you need to be drinking a little bit of the, the Jura because it's, it's, a, it's, it's the wind and rain and the adventure that it really portrays. A tremendous malt, but lots of different characters, but really coming back to American white oak and the oaks of France. The oaks of France is what gives this its uniqueness, its different style you know, as opposed to Dalmore. So the Oaks of France, there's a long history, uh, especially with cognac. You mentioned limousine and Troncai oak. Um, yes. You know, we tend to just kind of lump French oak all together as one thing when we're using it here in the American whiskey industry, and it's not at all. And so you have this uh, pedunculate oak, right? You have, you, have, you have two different main types of French oak, these, that kind of wider grain and the tighter grain. Yeah. And you're using yeah. both in this whiskey, right? That's right. Because even if we take Le Batrange, Le Batrange, it, we find, gives us that kind of tropical, um, it's kind of that lovely fruity note. There's still a little bit of spiciness, but it's more that fruit, that, uh, you know, pear, peach sort of note that comes from long uh, maturation. They're not all done, I have to say, immediately on the same uh, proportions that they have to be assembled, the assemblage has to be assembled, which will be fitting together. But Betrange in particular is one that gives us that, that kind of fruity orchard fruit note that gives it that charm that we're looking for. So that will be slightly heavier than perhaps uh, even the Allier uh, wood that we use. This seems like it would be quite a challenge to blend to make a consistent product out of. Um, yeah. You know, I know it's relatively new, but so far, uh, <clears throat> if you've blended multiple batches, have, has anything surprised you from batch to batch on this and that maybe yeah. one of the oaks was coming on in a little too strong round two and you had to kind of... Yeah. Well, well, percentages? You, you, you've absolutely hit it in the nail because people just think, oh, you'll, you'll stick to the same formulation. Yes, generally we will stick to the same formulation, but Mother Nature and sometimes the staves or the act forest, uh, maybe the way it's been cut or, you know, the way it's been, you know, toasted or what have you, might have variation. And that's why we have to check every batch to make sure it attains a particular level, particular style, before we'll put the assemblage together. And even when we get that assemblage, when we bring them together, we give them some time to get to know each other. It's not a, a matter of taking a bit of that, throwing it together. It's, it's very much watching, waiting, and waiting is the right word here because they don't all just come of age or show the quality every time at the right period. So how much, so when you make, how much do you leave in store on Jura by the distillery and how much do you store like at Invergordon or in Glasgow or in some of your other sites? We, we normally store it until it's up of a particular age but when we want to do the transfer into a seasoning, that's when we will remove it 
to, uh, up to Invergordon, transfer okay. over, because what we have to do, and this is the natural classic example would be this particular one, when we do the transfer into these uh, seven different uh, woods, I have to check them. I can't go down to Jura on every occasion to see how it's going. So when it becomes of an age, We'll start the seasoning program and then watch it up at uh, Invergordon and see how it's going. That's way up the north of Scotland. Uh, from Glasgow, it'll take you about four hours to get there, sometimes longer if the police cameras are not about. But, uh, you know, it just depends. But, you know, that's where we'll take and we'll manipulate the style that we're looking for. Okay, so when there, because it's, I was thinking from a practical matter because it's not very easy to get material on and off a of Jura, mm -hmm. at no. least of any and, size. And you, people must realize that to get to Jura, you've got a number of options. You can fly, you can fly to Isla, that will take you 30 minutes. If it's a very strong wind, you'll be down there in 30 seconds. Uh, but normally speaking, about half an hour, then you get on a, a, a hired car or a taxi, that will take you over to the other side of the island. You get the ferry, you have to wait for that. <clears throat> That'll take you about four and a half minutes. And then you have to get in a car because Jura Distillery is eight miles from the ferry. So it's a long, long day trying to get there. And when you pass uh, from the ferry, your phone gets cut off. There's no communication at all until you're at the distillery. So you've got to be prepared. And sometimes you can get to the island and then you'll be stuck on the island because the weather Sometimes it's so bad. I've been there where a waterfall doesn't go down, it goes up in the air because of the strong <laughs> winds. I've had it on the island when there's no electricity and it's had a blackout. So this is island life. And when I say island life, I mean island life. When you get a distillery manager, it's no use taking them from the mainland. You must take them if you can get a hold of somebody that's lived on an island to appreciate that. Right. I always remember Mickey Hedge. Remember Mickey Hedge's uh, Brett? I love Mickey. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, he came over from Isla and he said, to, he went up to the shop on a Sunday and he said, um, I'm looking for the Sunday papers. He said, what? He said, I'm, I'm looking for the Sunday papers. Can you give me a copy? He said, no, you're on Jura. Sunday papers arrive on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. You know, and if the ferry's not running, yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, these are the stories, these are individuals, you know, you know, that's why, you know, only 11 people work on Jura Distillery, and, you know, you have to get on, you have to get on, not only with your distillery workers, but you have to get on with the community. The Jura community is part of the island, part of the distillery. Wonderful, wonderful place, and it's very much looking after each other. Even when Isla just distilleries are looking for help, Jura will help out with the Isla uh, distilleries as well. They have to look after each other. Yeah, I remember Willie Tate actually speaking about that like way back when, when Willie was there walking over and actually helping run Brook Lottie. Yeah. Years and years and years ago, just because they needed, the distillery was mostly mothballed, but not completely mothballed and it needed to get fired up and run periodically. Yeah, I mean, we looked after, you know, we, we owned that distillery and it, it was, you know, a great distillery, and, but we did have to help out. Whenever it's needed, you help out because it's a, a partnership. It's a very close sure. community when it comes to distilling. Right. Well, Mickey, Mickey's back on the, Mickey's, it's like Hawaii. Mickey's back on the big island now. He's on Isla instead of Jura. Yeah. So he's back yeah. in civilization, right? As much as it is in Port Ellen. Yeah. A, a lovely, lovely, lovely man, you know. We, we climbed the uh, Paps of Jura together, and I never forget, we, we had got to the top, and he, he took out his uh, satchel, he took out um, a bottle of uh, um, Jura Superstition, and we drank it, and it was the most perfect way to drink a whiskey at the top of the mountain, overlooking the whole of Jura. You could see Isla, and you could see over to Ireland. That was, that's when whiskey drinking is the most perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is, that is an absolutely perfect picture <laughs> for whiskey. Yeah. Yeah, and 
And I've got to wonder too, there was another person who was with you for a while. Is Greg Glass still working with White? Yeah, Mackay? absolutely. Greg's been with us now coming up four years. And he's, uh, he's just had a wee baby boy, Logan. And so his life is changing, you know. It's, uh, it's uh, a new addition to his family, but trying to tie him down, not to, you know, make sure he's there doing his feed and everything is uh, something brand new. He's, he's got a few weary eyes at the present moment, but he's getting there. I, I would bet. And then is he working pretty directly with you? Because when I first met Greg, he was actually helping create whiskeys with John Glazer down in Chiswick. Yeah, in Compass London. Box. He was there for yeah. some 17 years. Uh, so, you know, that was one of the big attractions about Greg because he did a lot of small blends and uh, small, you know, innovations. And therefore, he brought his innovation skills, you know, to, to uh, Dalmore, Jura, Fedeke, and Town of Ulan. So that we worked very well on that front. But he's, he looks seriously at what we can be expecting and the changes. And that's the kind of person we really wanted to fit in, uh, you know, for, for learning and for you know, even expanding from that, that kind of point of view. It was good. So, so good. Well, no, I'm going to say Dan Z has a question, which is interesting. Well, this could be good or could be bad. So Dan Z says he has an independent bottling of Dalmore that's extremely light in color. Um, and he wonders, does Dalmore add E150 to their regular offerings? Well, you know, that there's a lot of, you know, light whiskeys out there, independents. We have obviously have no control on that whatsoever. But I might, this is something that appears on many uh, areas. Uh, most of our age whiskeys, 35, 40, 21, 25, they're all kind of at small batches and therefore natural strength, natural color. <clears throat> but on occasions, if you want to, uh, you know, the 12 year old or what have you, in order to give us the consistency, we add obviously a small amount. But having said that, if you didn't, you get an inconsistency of color and therefore people would start complaining, why is this whiskey different from another? It mm -hmm. is all about getting consistency, which gives confidence to the consumer. Make no mistake about that. Because if you can't maintain your color consistently, people will get onto you, they'll start complaining and they'll say you've changed it. So it's getting the balance but I can share, as you know, Brett, more than anybody, it doesn't, you know, have any effect on the taste at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would guess that, you know, I would guess that for you guys it's difficult because it's there, depending upon the company, I know that a lot of distillers, especially distillers that are very meticulous about creating their brands, don't aren't fans of independent bottlings in general, not necessarily a good independent bottler but the fact that anybody can get their hand on a cast potentially and that's your brand name if they put a bad cask out there because every yes. cask isn't perfect some casks are go to different uses some aren't intended to be single malt some are maybe go for blending or for other purposes and you know I know that you're worried about your reputation being tarnished if somebody else gets their hands on something and puts it out there where they don't yeah, feel that their name is an independent modeler is as important as your name as yeah. a distiller. That's, that's why you got to take these things very cautiously. Uh, all I can tell you is that, you know, we take, we take oh, unbelievable care, you know, for any of our single malts, whether it be Dalmore or Jura. And as you can imagine, to build up a reputation in it, to be, have a different uh, criticism that's got nothing to do with us, perhaps. Sure. It, is very unfair, but these are things we unfortunately have to live with. Yeah. But well, generally, people are good, you know, whichever the producers are, they generally try and produce something at the end of the day. They, of course. Got, they've got to satisfy their own customers, like just like we have to. Yep. So uh, we kind of went in a tasting order. You had suggested to me before we went on the live feed here and kind of... Uh, you had suggested starting with the stronger whiskeys first, which I think is kind of, you tend to hear a lot of that backwards. And I think people are, I think people are a little confused on that in that normally, like if you're going to taste a peaty whiskey or something, you taste it last, but you suggested we finish with King Alexander here. And how, why would you want to start with the higher proof whiskey first and work back to the 40%? I, I wanted to just to, to show that, okay, 
even a higher strength if you approach it with reverence and respectability and try and look at these port wine flavors and really take your time, it will allow you, the palate to open up, uh, move on to the 42% of the seven oak, and then we're going down to something really complex. This is uh, the Dalmore King Alexander, six different finishes, and this is something really to sip and savor and to finish the evening. This is something that demands and requires a longer, longer time. So I'm hoping that perhaps people will see the beginning of the 46.5, might find it a bit stronger, but what it isn't, it's not a peaty style, it's not a smoky style, so therefore the taste buds should be kept pretty pretty uh, okay with, with that approach. Uh, but if, if we are, you know, looking at the King Alexander, this is the King Alexander, as you can see, it's quite low, uh, because uh, this is one of my favorites, this is one I tend to drink a lot of, and during this particular uh, period, I've uh, had my share uh, over the weekend, uh, but still done in moderation. But this is this is one of my favorites. Uh, the King Alexander the Third is quite a mouthful. Um, this is uh, to do with uh, the fury of the stag, and anybody that's not uh, familiar with that, if I can just show you, this is uh, this is the fury of the stag. This is the painting by your great uh, American artist. Uh, I, I love you guys, but this is done by your American artist, Benjamin West, in, in um, 1786. Uh, he painted this. If you're not familiar with him, well, go to the White House because he painted Ashamed of the Peace that hung in the White House. And when John Adams, the second president, went there on the 1st of November, 1800, he actually had that painting, which was never finished by the same man. He also did, of course, the death of Nelson, uh, who, of course, was shot at 3.47 in the afternoon of the 21st of October, uh, 1805. But anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's the, the fury of the stag. And as you'll see from that, uh, Benjamin West uh, was looking at it. You'll see um, the king lying on the ground, and you'll see uh, the stag, which was just about to rip him apart. When he takes the spear, he kills the stag, and he saves the king. And because he saves the king, he's granted the lands of Kintail. But more importantly, if your name is Mackenzie, you can use the stag emblem. And therefore, when Andrew Mackenzie arrives at the distillery in 1867, he remembers that event. And that's why any Mackenzie that you meet in or around the world, the emblem of theirs will be the stag's head. So that's what he wanted to remember. Uh, when Andrew McKenzie started. And so we wanted to build it up, called the Fury of the Stag, the only single malt in the world with six finishes. Port, Madeira, Marsala, Cabernet Sauvignon, small batch bourbon, and Methuselah Sherry. And this is a great assemblage. And this is of course coming in not at a higher strength, but naturally, almost naturally at 40%. And this allows you to really look at the style, the chocolate box, as I call it, really making sure it's what it's all about. So this is, so these, so how do you scout out getting barrels that are getting, getting casks that are already this low of alcohol? I mean, it sounds well, like as if you're really already most of the way there. Well, what we've always done is taken like Cabernet Sauvignon in this, will be taken from Chateau Haute Marbouzi in the Boyac area of Bordeaux. As soon as it's emptied, we literally will try and get that emptiness of, from uh, Bordeaux on the Monday, and it will be in our warehouses by the Wednesday, still very damp. We empty out the wine and immediately fill it, and it will stay in that cask seasoning for up to about 18 months. Same with the uh, uh, port wine, be five okay. years. Uh, Madeira Marsala, normally around three years. But really, when you look at this, when you look at this style of that, you'll see a whole assemblage of all these wonderful flavors coming together. The softness, the, the radiance, but you'll see that hint into balsamic, the port wine coming through, the honey, you name it. It's just pure luxury. And this is, needs to be really sit and held long in the palate 
to let these lovely flavors come through. But the DNA, that chocolate of the Dalmore is still very much there. But really hold it long in the palate. If you've got a King Alexander, if some of you have never tried this before, all I can tell you is this is pure luxury. This is absolutely bursting with flavors and mm. real, charm, real elegance. Uh, and a big slangy bar. Mm. 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 Yeah, we, lo we loaded in King Alexander today to make sure that nobody would go thirsty when they were watching. <laughs> but let me just tell you, once again, it's all about the cask, 80%. If I haven't said it, I'm going to say it again and again. 80% of that influence comes from the cask. If you get the right cask and then look after it, it'll give you what you're looking for. Don't go for any cheap cask. Make sure you know the history of the cask. You know the, the wine that's been in it. You know the staves that's been in it, how it's been made up. And you know that it's been taken care of and then nurture it as it comes in and you put the assemblage together. So Richard, speaking of various casts here, we got an interesting question from Todd. Uh, that was a pretty long one here, but he's essentially asking with the rise in popularity of agave spirits like tequila and mezcal, have you tested any of those casks? And yeah. have you found if they're well-suited or maybe at odds with any of the malt distilleries, you know, Dalmore versus Jura versus Fettercairn? And if not, are there maybe any other types of casts that you have on the horizon that you're playing around with? Yeah. Don't forget, even before these laws were relaxed last year, for the first time you could use maybe tequila cask. You can maybe use Calvados cask. But let me just immediately say it has to conform with the color and it has to conform with the flavor of Scotch whiskey. If you deviate from that, you can no longer call it Scotch whiskey. So you're, you're bound by that but we have been looking at all these casks. Remember, the consumer, as I mentioned to you early, uh, is so demanding. So when we have the likes of Calvados, we have, uh, you know, uh, different areas, different small wineries, and even small uh, spirits that are around about, we are constantly looking at them, and we'll be changing and bringing them to the, the forefront when it's required. It's not a quick fix. We are not in this game for just saying, oh, it's been in a tequila cast alone for six months and that's given us a style. It doesn't work like that. We've got to wait, see, and see how compatible it will, will be. But rest assured, we're going to be working 10 years ahead to see if it does work. And you're saying, are you sure? Yeah, five to 10 years is a scenario to make sure that there's that compatibility that we've got that flavor, we've got that style, but we've got that luxury that's been always associated with the Dalmore or even with the Jura. Mm -hmm. I cannot keep going on about it. It's not a, it's a very slow process, but we'll only release it when it attains that particular quality level. Have you ever had any Carcavelos casks before? Are you familiar with Carcavelos? No, that's not, I'll be honest, that's not familiar with me. It's, some, it's a very small appellation of Portuguese, like fortified and aromatized wine and or oxidized. A lot, yeah, it's a lot like Madeira. It is apparently mm -hmm. one of the smallest EU AVAs or DOs because the whole DO is a couple of hectares in the hills outside of Lisbon mm -hmm. and right. Carcavalish. And it is, it's wild. It's like a really oxidized Madeira. Yeah, there it's really interesting. There are only a couple of families that are actually still. We had a we had a tealing. We had a single malt from tealing actually a couple of years ago that was finished in a Carcavelish cask, and um and I've seen more coming in the wine itself. We've seen some more come into the states recently through an importer named House Alpens, um, but it's yeah. really interesting. It would be it seems right up the Dalmore Alley, so to speak. Right. Well, we've got one or two. I can't can't tell you just now, but we have one or two. You know, Brett and yourself are talking to these small. That's what you need to get. You need to get something that's small and it's been not tried before. But more important, you need to have that style that will match, come right. back, character of your single malt. It's no use going for something fancy if it doesn't do anything. Sure. And what I want to do more than anything is for the consumer, when he looks at the whiskey, when he looks at it and knows it, he picks up something. He's got to pick up something and say, ah, 
I know what you mean. From the tasty notes, I see what's reflected in that. It, it can be hoodwinked. Oh, can you smell that? No, I can't smell it. It smells the same. You, you've got to have that difference. There's one more question then, because Jay and Karen Lee ask, and I think it kind of relates to what you're saying there, is do you have any any favorites for us as far as Dalmore or Jura goes? Uh, and what do you love in those specific whiskeys? Uh, for me, I really love that kind of ripe fruitiness with the Jura with a bit of that maritime character. I think that's just a match made in heaven that I find in a lot of coastal whiskeys. And I love that Dalmore wears what it is on its sleeve. Dalmore is a sherry finished whiskey, sherry aged whiskey, and that is unmistakably there in every Dalmore you drink. And I love that kind of that dark, you, you've mentioned prunes and plums a couple of times. That is, yeah, that is yeah. just the quintessential Dalmore thing and the chocolate notes that come from those big, heavy fortifies, fortified wine casts. That's what I love about Dalmore. If I had a Dalmore that didn't taste like that, I think I'd be a little suspicious. Well, you know, the way you're talking, the way it's been saying that, the way she's portrayed it, absolutely brilliant because she's identified the key component parts. That's what we must maintain. If people know that chocolate orange with that cinnamon spice and, you know, that richness that we associate with Dalmore, that's what it's about. And the lovely tropical, the fruitiness of the, the Jura. That, that, that's what you must kind of maintain. That's why they all have their different facets, but taken at the right time, the right place. And more importantly than anything, sharing it with the people that you love, that's what it's about. Well, cheers to that. Agreed, 100 percent agreed with that, definitely. <laughs> and you do. So it's it's. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand. You pointed it out better than a lot of people we had that you do a lot of what is being created now for a lot of people, especially in, as you're advancing in your career. There's a lot of work and creation you do that you'll never reap the war rewards of. Yeah. Absolutely, and I, I can I can put my hat on my heart and want to have you in my hand in my heart and say yeah. But when I see you coming in the market, I'll be saying yeah, I remember that. And uh, you know we had to wait for that because uh, you know they're not always ready. they're not. We are dependent on Mother Nature. We're dependent on the warehouses. You know people say to me a warehouse is a warehouse. No, it's not. When you open no, the not at all. slide these big doors open. You stop at the door, then you smell it around. Is this a damp warehouse? Is it a dry warehouse? Is it racked? Is it three high? Is it on pallets? Because they're all gonna have their differences and they're gonna affect your whiskey. And you have to have these pockets going on all the time. And then when you notice it, you say, hello, are you asleep here? It's time to move you into a three high or a two high or on your own nearest the wall. Why nearest the wall? Because it's nearest the maritime climate that's going to be drifting in there. That's what nurtures and that's what gives you the style that you're looking for. But again, how long will it take? As long as it takes. As long as it takes. So is that a big part? So, so that is also another thing that you're doing when you said you're in Invergordon a couple of times a year to do an extensive pass-through. So then uh, how, how much of your stock do you think gets moved at any one point in time or another as you're going through and doing these periodic tastings? Uh, we do a lot of moving, you know, a lot of, you know, I've, I've seen Brett, you know, a cask, I say to Margaret, what's wrong with her? She, she's asleep. And then I think, okay, I'll give you two more years. You give her two more years and you go back to the cask and you went, so you finally decided to get out of your bed. You are beautiful. You know, you, you, you see it, you see the change. And people look at me and say, you're talking rubbish, Richard. No, I'm not. Because when you go down a row of casks and you just, hello, I wonder what I'm going to do today. And then suddenly you go, well, hello there. You just know everything clicks. It's like a beautiful painting. You get all the colors, everything's perfect. And then you say, wow. When a news guy hits the scoop of his, uh, you know, of his newspaper, he gets all the right facts and everything comes together. Well, it's the same with the whiskey. You just know when something's right. And that's when you want a bottle. And then it wins a gold medal and you say, it was right. Not only that, but the consumer, the judges saw it. You know, that's how it works. 
Well, Richard, technology. thanks again for all your insight into everything old and patient and uh, flavorful with Dalmore and Jura tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, everybody else, thanks for tuning in and listening to Richard. Uh, always great having someone with that, that kind of experience and uh, I would say energetic way of method of tasting whiskey onto our tasting. So, Richard, cheers to you. Everybody else, we'll be back next week for another Wednesday. Richard, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Pat. And I wish all my American friends a very good night. Please stay safe, stay well. You guys over here are thinking about you guys over there. We're all together, but please stay safe, but stay happy as well. Cheers, all right, cheers everyone. Thanks, Richard. Next time I see you, my friend, it'll be in Glasgow. Okay. Take care. Take care, Brett. And belated happy birthday. Thank you. All right.